What's up guys, Joe at Momentum Works. Today I wanna to talk about boost pressure. Um, and if you're asking us how much more boost pressure you're gonna make, why that's the wrong question to ask. Stay tuned. Tell my analytics that people don't like to watch through whole videos. So if you're not here for the entertainment, let me just give you all the facts real quick. Obviously these two turbos can produce 30 PSI. But 30 PSI from this turbo is not the same as 30 PSI from this turbo. By only being concerned with PSI, you're completely negating CFM or any other dimension. PSI is just one dimension of what a turbo's performance should be gauged by. Now, this turbo will flow so much more than this will at 30 PSI. This turbo will also work much less hard. This compressor wheel doesn't have to work as hard to make 30 pounds as this one. This wheel working so hard generates more heat. And as we know, heat is the enemy. It's impossible for us to tell you how much more boost or power a turbo is gonna make on your specific application because things like elevation, fuel quality, and other tuning related things are gonna feed in to how this turbo reacts on your engine. So by just making a blanket statement, the way people say, ah, it's five, 10, 20 pounds of boost, it's mostly bullshit. To be a science and you don't need to really know anything about compressor mapping or turbo sizing to pick the correct turbo as long as you work with a shop that's familiar with your application just tell them what you're looking to achieve and chances are they've already done the real world testing and they can help you pick a turbo that's going to work best for you in your application so I've been wanting to make this video for a while. Um, I just kind of wanted to think of a good way to really illustrate this. Really to start it off, I mean, a lot of guys, when they're talking about turbos, they're talking about PSI, you know, how much boost are you making? 30 pounds, 40 pounds, 50 pounds. And why this is a good gauge, no pun intended, because boost gauge, um, this is a good gauge of performance. It's not the end all be all. And the first parallel I can draw, um, here's a can of Red Bull. It's sugar and salt free, because Steven, you know, is worried about my health. What a good, stupid friend. Anyway, like right off the bat, if you look at this and you see here, you know, the camera's kind of backwards, but you see calories. And I like to think of calories as like boost. And you think, oh, wow, you know, like th this is 15 calories. It's so good for you. But yeah, it's still full of other shit. And turbos is the same way. Yeah, you know, you might be making 40 pounds of boost, but you have to think about things like the flow rate um, and how much heat that compressor is generating because the hotter the exhaust gas is, the less air molecules can be pushed together um, because of expansion and contraction. So, you know, think about boost like you would think about calories. You know, the calories are important, but you also have to look about how many grams of sugar, how many grams of salt. And that's all the other parameters that go into the performance makeup of a turbo. So, you know, while boost pressure is important, it's only one, you know, one dimension. You know, let's talk about some of the other dimensions. Um, you know, the other big thing you want to think about other than pressure is flow. Um, now, take, for example, a pressure washer and a garden hose. You know, a pressure washer might be flowing 3,000 PSI, uh, whereas a garden hose is like 10. Um, but obviously, the garden hose is flowing much more water. And to illustrate same... pressure versus volume, this is 15 PSI. This is also 15 PSI. Which one do you think moves more air? Obviously, this one. It's moving more volume. Look at the outlet on this, and look at the outlet on this. This is where our pressure ratios come from. And the same thing happens with turbos. So one of the big things you'll hear with turbos when you're really getting into the nitty gritty, uh, you'd hear about compressor maps. And in a compressor map, you're gonna wanna look at a couple different things. You're gonna wanna look at your pressure ratio, you're gonna wanna look at your mass flow rate, you're gonna wanna look at the surge line, the choke line, um, and you wanna look at the efficiency islands. And we can bring up a compressor map here. And guys, again, this is one of those things where you're really getting into the weeds. And you guys have to get out of the weeds. Uh, but I'm happy to share this with you, of course. Um, I am not by any means an expert. There's probably guys out there way smarter than me. I'm just some dumb truck parts guy. Um, but let's take a look at this. So basically, your pressure ratio, and let's, let's bring up the, uh, yep, perfect. Yep, that's what I want. So your pressure ratio is the absolute outlet pressure divided by the absolute inlet pressure. Um, basically, you know, the gauge in your vehicle is going to measure the pressure above atmospheric pressure. So if you're showing 20 pounds of boost, it's actually 34.7 pounds of boost because, uh, you know, the pressure at sea level, absolute pressure, is 14.7. So your boost gauge is measuring positive boost pressure. So we're always at 14.7. That's just atmospheric. So um, basically a natural aspirated vehicle, it's 
at that 14.7 already. So turbo boost is adding to that. So when your gauge is at zero, it's really at 14.7. Unless, of course, you're at higher elevation than sea level. The higher you are above sea level, the thinner the air is. So that number will go down. So just to get back to that. So our pressure ratio, which you'll see there is over on the left-hand side. That's your up and down on the, uh, the chart here for all you guys that remember science or whatever we charted in elementary school this is your mass flow rate so you're basically going to get this number you're going to take your boost pressure and then you're going to add 14.7 and divide it by 14.7 and again 14.7 is because we're at sea level um, your absolute pressure will vary depending on what your elevation is and that's one of the reasons that makes this so difficult um, to get to these parameters and why this is more of really not a perfect science even though it's science so your mass flow rate is the physical mass of air flowing over a given period of time. And this is often expressed as like pounds per minute uh, or CFM. So CFM would be cubic feet per minute. Um, and, you know, how we determine what our desired flow rate is and to, to generalize in gasoline engines, of course, you know, while we do mostly diesel engines here, for gasoline engines, you're going to generate nine and a half to ten and a half horsepower at the flywheel for every pound per minute. So basically, if, if you're trying to make 400 horsepower, you're gonna need a turbo that does 40 pounds per minute. Um, and again, this is not a perfect science. This is just a rough guesstimation. Uh, I'm waiting for someone to tear my ass up in the comments because they're gonna say everything I'm saying is wrong. But there's a reason why we're going over all this. Um, and at the you know, as we go through this video, I'll tell you how to actually size the correct turbo for your application. Um, aside from our mass flow rate, which is running along the bottom of our chart, you'll see that we have some other lines. Um, so the line on the far left, that's going to be our surge line. So basically, that's the left-hand boundary of the compressor map. Um, this area is plagued by flow instability. Um, you know, basically, at this flow instability is basically at the point where the turbo is going to start to bark or flutter. Um, this is where you're getting your surge. And basically, this is because the, the motor literally cannot ingest any more air. So that air is coming back through the turbo. So basically, your turbo is making boost pushing it through your charge air cooler pipe. At this point, your motor can't take any more. So the air is coming back across the turbo. And that's why you're getting that buffeting noise. Um, and basically the surge line can be altered by the compressor map groove. Let me throw a picture of that up here. Um, depending on the map groove there, you can kind of get rid of some of the surge. Uh, but again, you want to find a turbo that's going to work, that's not operating within that surge line all the time. The other thing that causes surge, and this happens more in vehicles that have a throttle plate. Um, you know, if you're wailing on the throttle and then all of a sudden you let off you chop the throttle and you don't have a blow off valve all that air needs to go somewhere so if you don't have a blow off valve to vent that air it's just going to come back through the turbo um and, and it's going to create surge because all that air is going to come back across the compressor wheel and out your air cleaners uh the other thing we want to talk about is the choke line so on the other side of this map you'll see that line down there that's your choke line so basically at this point the turbo is no longer efficient um, your compressor wheel speed is going to start to go through the roof. So your shaft speed is going through the roof, and this is where you're going to snap a shaft. Um, and also at this point, the wheel is working so hard and generating so much heat. And as we know, heat is the enemy. The charge there going through your charge air cooler, your charge air is going to have to work so much harder to cool this air because the hotter air is less dense. You're going to make less power because there's less air molecules. Now, the thing that we want to talk there in the middle kind of looks like a <laughs> Can I save a <laughs> on YouTube? Steven, can I save a <laughs> on YouTube? the thing that looks like a in the center of the screen uh, that's basically your efficiency island um, and as those rings go further out the turbo gets less efficient so realistically what you would do is you would plot points on this compressor map um, depending on what your rpm is how much flow rate yada 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 you would plot your points on this and you want to get as many points in the efficiency map um, in the efficiency island as you can of course, the island in the center is the most efficient, and as the rings go out from there, it gets less and less efficient to when you get to your choke line and your surge line, where it's completely inefficient, and it's really not a turbo you should use. Other things to consider when you're buying a turbocharger and sizing it for your application is the turbine AR, and AR is only one dimension. Um, you could also, it's CM squared is another one that it's done by, but let's just talk about AR because that's most common for us. Uh, basically, the smaller ARs are going to spool it faster, 
and the larger ARs are going to support bigger peak horsepower. Now, a lot of guys would just say, you know, why don't you just get a huge housing? Well, because then you're going to lose all your spool up and your EGTs are going to go through the roof. So you really want to find a housing that's in between too small and too large. It's just right. You know, like the little baby with pards, this one's too cold, this one's too hot, this one's just right. You really want to find one that's just right. Now, AR is not a static measurement. It's derived off of the exhaust wheel. So basically, if you're talking about S400 versus S500, the S400 uses an 88 by 96 millimeter wheel and the S500 uses a, a 99 by 110. Don't quote me, I'll throw the correct specs here in the video afterwards. But basically a 115 on that smaller wheel is different from a 115 on the larger wheel because AR stands for area by radius, which is a, a dimension or dimensions are drawn from the dimensions of the wheel. So even though it's 115 and 115, that's just a ratio. So if your exhaust wheel changes, that ratio will also change. So like I said, the 115 on your S500 is going to be much larger than your 115 on your S400 because of the wheel size. So it's important to consider your exhaust housing side, of course, along with everything with your compressor map as well. Look, I knew I threw a ton of information at you guys, and I'm really not that smart, so I probably didn't do a great job explaining it because there's probably a bunch of things I don't understand myself. But there are generators out there, Borgwerner, Garrett, they all have these generators out there. You can pop in all your dimensions of what you're looking for, and it'll spit out the, you know, the different size turbos that'll work for your application. But more importantly than that, majority of setups out there have already been done, guys. I mean, I know that we all like to think that we're really unique and, you know, our own individual style, but the internet's a vast resource. There's a good chance if you're building some sort of setup, it's already been done before. So there's already someone who's tried all the turbos and knows what turbos work. And for us specifically in our business, I mean, we've done so many customer setups that if you say, hey, I got this injector, this cam on my C15, we already know what turbo is going to work best for you. So you don't need to do all of this math. And yeah, if you want to know about it here, here's all the information. But really, Realistically, when you're buying a turbo, buy it from someone who's already done this before and, and knows what you need. That's why they're in the business. Um, and, you know, it's not always a perfect science. What works on paper might not work actually. Whereas, you know, when you go and deal with someone who is in this business and has done these turbo setups before, they've already tried in the real world what works and what doesn't. And that's really valuable information. And fortunately, that information's all over the internet and it's all over with different guys like ourselves and other shops out there that already know what you need. So while this information is great to know, just give somebody a call or do a quick Google search and you could probably find an ideal turbo um, and an ideal exhaust housing for whatever setup it is that you're working on. Don't reinvent the wheel here, guys. This information is already out there. You know, just take a little time to read and figure out what's going to be best for you or watch some YouTube videos or, you know, hey, pick up the phone and say, hey, Momentum Works, this is what I want. This is what I want to do. What turbo do I need? And I'll be like, yo, guy, this is the turbo you need. Bit bop, shaboop. What size t-shirt do you wear? I'll give you one. So as the time ticks on, I realize this video is getting really long. I hope I didn't ramble too much on you guys. Um, you know, basically, this is what you would need to pick a turbo. But chances are the information you need, you know, it's already been done and you can get that turbo. If you have any questions about picking a turbo size, please don't ask me. Uh, but if you have a specific question about a turbocharger for a Caterpillar C15, a Detroit, you know, N14, any sort of Cummins, you know, basically Class 8 truck, you know, we've done it before and we can help you out and we can set you up. Guys, thanks for watching. I hope you learned something. I had a lot of fun doing this video and I hope you had a lot of fun watching. Take care. See ya.